Uh, buenos días, good morning. Ay, no sé, agüitas. Good morning, buenos días. Uh, could we have more energy? Buenos días, good morning. Gracias. Um, es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. My name is Yosimar Reyes. Um, I'm a poet, a writer. Um, I happen to be a little immigrant and stuff, so most of the work um, that I'm writing about, it's about our experiences as immigrants in this country. Um, y yeah, I'm a little nervous because, you know, I was like, oh my god, I'm back in high school. I, I you guys are probably taller than me, so I'm a little like, oh, <laughs> chaparrito problems. Pero, we're going to continue with it. Um, pero, um, I'll start off with a poem. <clears throat> that way you know, like, OK, he's legit, you know, because sometimes I come and speak and tell people that I'm a poet. And they're like, but he didn't do no poems. Um, so I'll start off with a poem, and then we'll get into the presentation um, and a little bit of the work that I'm doing um, around the country. Um, el, el po este poema says, everybody speaks Spanglish? Oh, OK, chill. This is my audience then, because sometimes I go and I read poems, and people are like, ¿Qué dijo? And I'm like, use the context clues, and then you'll find out what I said, because that's how I learn English in this country, OK? Um, ese se llama lo que soy. This is my nature, the truth in my heart, the breath in my lungs. Yo soy the one you fear, the one that got away. Soy el único que se te fue. Yo soy el hijo que nunca será padre, el nieto que nunca será husband. I am the near and the far of earth and sky, el sol y la luna. Soy everything that is in between, entre el hombre y la mujer. Soy el ser que por tu ignorancia no quiere reconocer. I am the one you define with hate, the one that doesn't fit your labels but manages to reclaim his name. Yo soy dualidad. Y aunque digas que esta es la misma canción, el mismo poema, te repito que nosotros seguimos hablando de compasión. Yo soy de fuego y tierra, de mares que liberan de muertes silenciosas, yo soy la muerte que me deseas, I'm the destruction and reparations of freedom in cages, I'm the bird that still sings praises, y con todas mis fuerzas te digo que tu odio me libera, porque más que espíritu enjaulado, yo soy el poder de la conciencia. Thank you. Uh, uh, I started, I started writing, I started, when I was in high school, I used to be really shy, really bashful, because high school is really intimidating. And obviously, because you're coming into your own, um, where especially your junior year in your high school, you're trying to develop. I think it's when you're trying to, at 16, is when I think the world was unraveling with, for me. Y me estaba dando cuenta de las diferentes obstacles that I was facing as a young person. Um, Obviously, I think for me, it was very interesting because um, it's when I started, I, 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 I found writing. Shout out to all the English teacher. I was an English major um, in college, and English was lo que se me hizo fácil. I can't do math, so shout out to the nerds that do math, but not me. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I like to talk, so English and me so muy fácil. So um, my English teachers, and I think this is why it's very important for us to read books. All I feel like a lot of people don't say like, oh, I don't write, like to read, or I don't like books. But the reality is that oftentimes we don't like books because we haven't found books that reflect our experience or because we're not reading authors that remind us of where we come from. And so hopefully, for me, as a writer, I think that became my mission. I wanted to write stories and poems and books that reflected where I came from. And so so um, this presentation that I'm going to give is a little bit overview um, de donde vengo and the, what is that what is that propelled me to become the writer um, that I'm doing um, that I and the themes that I write about. Um, I, I titled this presentation "We Never Needed uh, Papers to Thrive." Um, these are my abuelitos. That's my grandma and my grandpa. They're the ones that carried me into this country. Legit, mi abuelito put me on his back and carried me over the frontera. So I didn't even want to be here. I was just like, OK, I'm here. I woke up and like, OK, we're in America. Um, so blame them that I'm here. Um, but I'm so grateful for their sacrifice, because obviously, I think my grandparents, oftentimes when we talk about immigrants, we seldom, we talk about dreamers, and we talk about young people. We seldom talked about undocumented elders and our viejitos, our grandparents that are stuck between this place of wanting to return home, but no pueden, because they realize that cuando se regresen home, they're going to die missing us. And so I think for me, I'm really proud to show my grandparents, because they're the reason why I do this work, and they're the reason that I continue to kind of represent in the way that I do. Um, so that's my abuelito and, and my grandma. 
Um, I have something called DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's an executive order signed by Obama in 2012. It grants me the authorization to work for two years. Every two years, I pay the government $400 and then I five dollars and they allow me to continue to work so I can pay taxes and, you know, give citizens their break on unemployment. So if I always tell citizens, if you ever file for unemployment, you're welcome. Those are my tax dollars. Um, uh, and I like to say that because oftentimes when we hear myths about DACA folks or undocumented people in this country, there's this idea that undocumented people are stealing resources, right? I don't get it sometimes because people say that we're lazy and that we're stealing jobs. So it's like an oxymoron, like how are you lazy and stealing jobs at the same time? It's kind of awkward. Um, but I, you know, but I initially I used to think that the rhetoric of me saying like, um, no, I'm not here to st steal your job, like, so I can like make people less scared of me. But the reality is, most likely you're not qualified to do the job that I do, sir. So uh, <laughs> get it together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So um, this is the first time that I went to um, uh, to get my DACA, and obviously because I like um, clothing, I wanted to match with the Homeland Security blue, um, and because I didn't know if I was gonna come out, you know, like si va si va salir de la oficina de inmigración. So I was like, let me take a picture in front of the address in case people are looking for me, <laughs> and then they were like, that's the last place he was seen. So hint, people, si van a salir, always leave a clue, okay? Because um, I was born in 1988. If you are into math, you can do the math skip. Um, I'm originally from the state of Guerrero, Mexico, which is southern Mexico. Shout out to all the people from El Sur de Mexico. Um, and I'm proud to say for, that I'm from that place because oftentimes when we talk about Mexico, people think that all Mexicans are the same, which in reality, Mexico is vast and diverse in our cultures and in our histories. And Guerrero being one of the three indigenous states in Mexico is very important to note. We have Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Puebla. Uh, which are very essential in the history of Mexico. And I like to say that proudly because I think one of the things that happens in our country oftentimes is that we live in a state that oftentimes negates um, our indigenous roots. A lot of people are embarrassed to claim that they're indigenous or come from the indigenous place, but I think there's a lot of rich and a lot of culture in us claiming that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm from, the, from El Sur de Mexico. Um, a lot of our traditions are different. We eat tamales in hoja de plátano. We are more into cumbias than like norteñas. Um, yeah, different, we're more coastal. So, um, muy, muy diferente la cultura in, in Guerrero. Um, oftentimes, in, when we're marching, um, protestas, we shout like, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And I find that ironic, because I was like, bro, I crossed that. Like, <laughs> I came from all the way down there. The border's all the way up here, OK? So I definitely was crossing it. And I crossed the border at three years old. While most people are getting potty trained, I was destined to be an overachiever. Um, <laughs> So definitely, so I always start off with that, like, you can't be, like, that's a good, like, you know, a good bio. Like, I crossed the border at three, what were you doing? Uh, so, um, muchas veces, when I started coming out and telling my story about being undocumented, a lot of people wanted me to, like, recount this really tragic story. And people, like, ask me all the time, like, how did you cross the border? How did you cross the border? And then, you know, honestly, I feel like my parents gave me NyQuil and I just woke up here, so it's very anticlimactic. But people wanted me to recount like this tragic Rosa de Guadalupe story. <laughs> you know, they were like walking for days in the desert. I'm dehydrated and I hear la Virgen and I hear un me sopla el viento and. And like, you know, really inspirational. But the reality is that I didn't want to tell those stories. I didn't want to recount those stories because I feel like there was already enough stories of how hard the lives of undocumented people are in, are in this country. Our lives are difficult. Even as immigrants, as poor people, as working class immigrants trying to make it in this country is very difficult. And so for me, I was not interested in telling those stories. I wanted to tell stories about joy. I wanted to tell stories about how we dance. I want to tell stories about how we fall in love. I want to tell those stories that are more inspirational, right? Oftentimes we get caught up in how tragic our lives are that I don't really, that's not how I operate, right? I always think about like at family gatherings, at Christmas, at Thanksgiving, when your tia is recounting this really traumatic story and you're like, bro, that's kind of heavy. Y'all need therapy. But, 
But instead of that, people are laughing. And I think that, I think I find that powerful. Like how do we utilize laughter to cope with the hardships of our lives? Um, and for me, that's why I use a lot of comedy in the work that I do. And that's why I try uh, to, to, to kind of stick to that. So now I just make up stories when people ask me, I'm like, oh yes, you know, my grandma, she heard a voice and then told us to come here. <laughs> Um, I crossed over in 1991. Um, a lot of you are like, oh my god, that was a while ago. Um, I crossed over in 91, um, pero my upbringing was very Americanized. I came here when I was three years old. By the time I was in kindergarten, um, I think that was my first memory, kindergarten, in Miss Jimenez's class. Um, I remember my, the first book, Clifford the Big Red Dog, and wondering why this dog was so big. Um, and so I think those, those are my first memories. I already spoke English. My prima started um, school earlier. Um, back in the day, we didn't have lyrics.com, so you had to like sit by the radio and write down all the lyrics. If you're trying to learn a new language, basically do that, and that, you know, it's, it's good for your, um, for, for your learning. Um, but yeah, very Americanized. I grew up in Eastside San Jose, which is Silicon Valley. I grew up in a predominantly Mexicano neighborhood. Um, we didn't really have mass diversity. Uh, most of the people that I grew up with were uh, working class. And I think I'll, it's interesting how in this country we don't talk about class. We don't talk about poverty. We don't talk about, you know, we talk about race right now. You know, our country is going through this idea of like we're confronting um, racist policies, right, with Black Lives Matter movement, con todo lo que está pasando. But rarely do we talk about class and the way in which class also polices your imagination. I grew up in an apartment complex. Most of my apartments were. Uh, inhabited by undocumented immigrants, so everybody was trying to get by. I always, I always joked that my block was like an ice hot spot. Like it was, that's where we congregated. You know, when cucarachas se juntan, that was us. Um, and so I, I, I think about that because when I was growing up. I remember constantly being frustrated with my predicament. I was constantly frustrated that I live in a two-bedroom apartment, that we're living in the living room, that my grandparents are, you know, there's no way my grandparents are going to help me go through school or go to college. Um, and so for me, I was constantly frustrated with, with uh, my, my upbringing. Uh, my grandparents, they're older. Uh, my grandma compró el inglés sin barreras, but she never put the videos on because she never learned one word of English. Um, and nobody would hire them. They're older, están viejitos, they come from a different country. Um, I think a lot of times people assume, right, they, there's this idea that if you want to be incorporated into this country that you should learn the language. But the reality is that people should learn Spanish because that's what everybody's speaking. Um, but the reality is that it's very difficult. It's very difficult to come to a new country, trying to survive, and trying to make it. Um, so the last thing you, in your head is like, oh, let me stay up and learn a new language. Um, but my grandparents, nobody would hire them. Um, we didn't have a social security number, so what they ended up doing was recycle bottles and cans. Um, I like to joke that my grandma was like, you know, in the green movement before it was cool. Um, and I think most immigrants are like that. You know, vas a la tienda en las bolsas, you don't throw them away because you use them for trash bags. Um, there's different ways that you recycle in immigrant working class neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods and families. So my grandparents um, built a network recycling bottles and cans, and it's pretty amazing to see that they went to the local restaurants and los restaurantes mexicanos would save the recyclables for them, and then they started a routine every week. This is what they did, and this is how they raised me. Um, and I find that like a beautiful metaphor to a lot of immigrants in this country, in which we take what little is left and we built a life from it. And I think that is really inspirational. Um, and now that's why I'm proud to show this picture. Um, in this picture, you see them. In, uh, to anybody that might not be from my neighborhood, they probably feel sorry for them. But I think one of the biggest things for me is like the pride and dignity in which our parents go to work. Um, and the, you know how proudful they are to work. And, and I, 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 really, I really look up to that. I go all around the country um, because of COVID. I was doing a lot of Zoom events, but before that, I was going all, out of the, all over the country. I was going to a lot of red states. Oftentimes, my audience did not look as you know beautifully colored as you. Um, so, a veces me daba miedo, right? Because people are like, oh my God. Um, you know, Especially when you tell people you're undocumented, people want to argue with you. They're like, why are you still here? And I'm like, bro, because I want to be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're not the president. <laughs> 
Um, but I think for me, the biggest thing is like people asking me for my safety. Are you afraid? Are you afraid that by you being so public and being so out that you're going to be a target or people are going to come after you? Um, and the realization is that not so much. I feel like I come from a beautiful community. I feel like by being out so outspoken and out, I have been built a network around the country of other undocumented people that are doing amazing work. I, sometimes I go to these really rural states um, where there's other undocumented people just organizing, building scholarships, or making sure that there's like more attention towards us. And so I think this is like really beautiful. And I think that's what inspires me, that even though wherever you go, you will always find a little group that is like, oh, listen, we're going to do something together. And that, I think it takes a group of people to make a change, right? So even as small as the group is, I think I find very in, a lot of inspiration in that. Um, I like to do a little, like, um, uh, como se dice, retrospect of history. Um, I, I, I'm a history nerd, too. Um, English was cute. History was also the one that I passed. Um, pero history is important because I think it's muy importante to know that the policies that we see today in our government, y lo que está pasando, obviously, there's no way for you to be missing what's happening because now you're, it's online, it's on Instagram, it's on TikTok, it's all over you, so you're aware of what's happening. And also how language is shifting, right? We're fighting bills in Florida, we're fighting bills in Texas, todo lo que Está pasando. Um, but in 1994, I like to argue that this is what I was raised under. In 1994, we have Governor Pete Wilson that had Prop 187 that was basically in California and basically stated that undocumented kids or undocumented parents did not have, should not have access to public resources, meaning undocumented kids could not go to public schools, um, K through 12. We could not go to public hospitals because we would not be assisted. And the same rhetoric that we're stealing, that we're taking, um, and and so this actually passed um, in California. And it was really unfortunate because this was kind of gave the blueprint to a lot of the anti-immigrant laws that we see in Arizona, in Iowa, in these red states. Thankfully, I live in California. And I think Oregon um, has uh, some pro-migrant um, laws too. But in California, I think it's one of the most progressive states for undocumented people. And the fact that we are granted driver's licenses right now, the state of California um, allowed for Medi-Cal to cover 65. 55 year olds and up, so full medical benefits for undocumented immigrants, regardless of, of their status. And I think right here in this in, the, in, in this state, there's a lot of um, immigrants that are fighting for similar um, representation for undocumented immigrants. I think one of the hardest things for our parents, right? Most of our parents do not go to the doctor because they rather go to the sobadora or the curandera. And you know, the ramas do help, but you know, sometimes you really do need a little Xanax. Uh, and you need a prescription. So por eso es muy importante also to advocate for health because you know most of us, you know, we need services, especially mental health services with everything that's happening. How do we get access to those things? So fighting for those things. In 1984, this is what I look like. Um, a little Banda Machos member. Um, <laughs> This was California's ni worst nightmare. And I would argue that this is our country's worst nightmare right now. Most of you who are, I know, I assume, are juniors right now, you are going to go to pursue careers in public office. You're going to become our next nurses, our next lawyers, our next doctors. You're probably going to run for office, hopefully, in city council. Whatever you're thinking about, you're going to be exercising a profession that's going to impact the community you come from. And because of that, I think a lot of people are scared that the more conscious you become Come. Most of you at 18 are become, become eligible voters. You're going to be able to kind of become involved in seeing the politics. They shape your neighborhood. If there's something that you don't like that's happening in your district, in your county, you're going to be able to have the power to say, like, I don't, I want to stop that. And I think this is the, 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 what we're fighting against. And this is why right now, if you're not aware, um, a lot of states are saying they're fighting against critical race theory. And critical race theory is basically the idea of you learning stories about people that come from neighborhoods like you. It's about, eventually, when I do publish my book, I hope that my book is one of the books that they're trying to ban, because that's an indicator that my book is a threat, because it's going to inspire other immigrants and undocumented people to not feel lesser than themselves in this country, to not feel like they're taking up space, but to actually feel like this country belongs to them, right? If you're born in this country, if you're a citizen, no matter if you are come from parents, are 
children of immigrants, you have just a right as everybody else to have be represented in, in be counted, um, and to have access to resources. So I really want you to take note of that because I think uh, this is how we build our power. 2016, we have the May 1st bo uh, boy, uh, marches. Um, obviously, nothing happened with the legalization. This is 26, 20, in 2000, this is 2006. So you need to think about how long we've been waiting for immigration reform. A lot of people are telling me like, oh my God, are you like excited about the DREAM Act? And I'm like, bro, the DREAM Act is like that boyfriend that tells you it's gonna change, but it's been 21 years. Uh, you gotta date other people, baby. Uh, open you up a tender and date other bills. Um, 2012, 2012 was the year that it was really popular to be undocumented. It was like Pokemon Go, everyone was trying to catch us. Um, we, ended up, we ended up in a lot of documentaries, a lot of books, a lot of the work was focused on us. Pero lo que estaba pasando, and I think this is why it's important, and I'm so excited that I'm here and I'm gonna be able to um, talk to some of y'all, is that what ends up happening is that when something is on trend, people wanna jump on it. Y lo que estaba pasando is that a lot of people were co-opting our stories. A lot of people who are not undocumented, who are not immigrants, who are not from our communities, were getting the benefits out of telling our stories. And this is what happens when you you do not know your story or you give it away, that other people will come in, take it, build profit out of it, and then you don't become the benefactor. And so for me, I didn't want to do that. I was like, listen, if you want me to cry on camera, this is how I'm going to charge per tier because therapy is expensive. Um, because I think like this is very important for us. Like your lived experience, the troubles and the traumas and the things that you carry and the things that you're trying to get rid of are the things that are gonna define you or the things that are gonna make you a stronger person. So it's important. Right now, they might seem like hurdles and they might seem like annoyances, but eventually that is what's gonna inform you and make you more equipped person. I think a lot of times school is intimidating, college seems intimidating, porque piensas que vienes a un lugar donde you're discussing like high thought. But the reality is that college is a place where you come to discuss your lived experience. You dissect why a community is suffering from poverty. You dissect race. You dissect all these things that you really carry with you. So I, 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 if you're intimidated of coming to college, just know that you already have an embodied lived experience that you're going to be teaching other students. That was me in my classes. I was an English major, and I was like the only brown one. I was like, you know, freedom writers, that chola girl in the back writing about the Aztecs. Um, but then I realized that a lot of the people that I was learning, they didn't know nothing about my neighborhood. They didn't really know how the actual world functioned. They didn't know that actual people recycle. So I would write in these stories about my abuela and my tias and everybody working. And people were like, oh my god, your characters are so colorful. Like, where did you, how does your imagination work? I'm like, bro, I'm legit writing what happened. I'm not even using my imagination. So I think for us, really think about our lives as dynamic as worthy to share because um, you know a lot of people are looking for that, um, what do they call it, flavor. Um, and we landed on the cover of Time Magazine. This is Time, uh, this is Jose Antonio Vargas, he's my mentor. Um, he open, happens to be a big figure in the immigrant rights movement. He came out as undocumented and people were shocked because he was not Mexican, he's Filipino. And people were like, oh my God, Undocumented people are Filipino too. Um, but actually, it, it's true. Most of the growing majority of undocumented people in this country are actually people that are coming and overstaying their visas. Um, they're not necessarily Mexican or, or Latino. Most Latinos are actually US born. Um, and so I think one of the ideas is how do we ta get rid of this notion that immigration is just a Latino issue, it's just a Mexican thing, when actuality it impacts everybody. Right now, we're seeing what happen what's happening with the Haitians at the border, and it's very interesting, I think where a lot of people are discussing, especially what's happening in Ukraine um, with the war, how the U.S. was able to welcome all these people from Ukraine, but yet brown immigrants or immigrants that are coming from all these other countries are still um, have to wait at the border because the U.S. does not want to welcome. So really thinking about what immigrants are welcome in this country and what immigrants do we do not find, we find as deportable or disposable. Um, 2018 is DACA got rescinded. So I have, do I have DACA. 
right now DACA is in a state where they're not taking new applications. So what's happening is that a lot of, if you're undocumented right now, most likely you don't qualify for this program. So you're going into school as fully undocumented with no resources. Um, but I think I, right now we're working to shift that. Um, we got a lot of celebrity support. But for me, I feel like it doesn't really matter because we don't really have anything that's defending us. Um, and then for me, I think for me what's next, I think one of the most important things, and this is the work that I do, is for me to continue to tell the story and for me to continue to write in the way that I do. One of the beautiful things that's happening right now is that a bunch of undocumented people are publishing books. Now we have, you can actually teach an English class with just undocumented writers, which is really, really amazing for me to see. These are some books, I know that some of you are like, oh, I hate reading. Um, but these are some books that I think that would be really amazing should you be interested in reading literature that discusses um, some of the issues that might impact you or your family. The Undocumented Americans by Carla Conejo Vicencio. She's the first undocumented, one of the first undocumented students to graduate from Harvard. Um, and she um, was long listed for National Book Award. Children of the Land by Marcel Mar Mar Hernandez Castillo is another great book. Um, that, that discusses him returning to Mexico after so many years. And The Body Papers by Grace is another great book that discusses her navigating the healthcare system um, through, um, through that. So yeah, this is kind of like the, uh, what informs my work. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read a couple of poems, and then I'll let you continue with your morning. Cool? Arre, OK. <laughs> We're going to, uh, you can clap. Rude. <laughs> um, you know, one of the amazing things um, right now I'm working, I finally got my book agent, so I'm working on my book proposal. So hopefully, primeramente, by the end of this year, we have a book deal. Um, and hopefully by next year, you'll be able to see the book out in the stores. But one of the things that I'm focusing on the book is how immigrants are super funny. Like, I feel like, you know, you think of your tias or like costumbres que hacen, and you're like, oh my god, why are you doing that? Um, and so I, 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 I like to write about those anecdotes. Um, this first poem is titled Undocumented Joy. Um, and I wrote it thinking about how people constantly ask me to relieve this tragic border crossing story where it's like, bro, it doesn't exist because I don't remember. Um, so it goes like this. I don't remember crossing, so I cannot tell you about the journey. Sometimes I close my eyes and imagine a pitch black sky with a thousand little stars. I imagine a poetic crossing, my grandmother's hand tugging at my arm, a rush of wind, abuelo leading the way. I imagine crossing without fear, just dreams, and my abuela's goals to raise my brother and I into hardworking men. I cross without the trauma latching onto my body. I cross on scar, even though mis viejitos tell me how they had to stuff the four of us in the backseat of a car. Sometimes I wish I could remember then maybe, just maybe, I will have another story to tell. I can only tell you how poor we were, living in that small apartment in the east side, how embarrassed I was to invite my friends over, even though we all lived like this. I can only tell you how poor, I, uh, how proud I was of my abuela, who asked me to teach her English, scribbled on the refrigerator door. Sometimes you can see the residue of the markers used to teach her basic words. I wish you would ask of the memories I had before my identity beca became political about the laughs, the joy, the things I love, about the way we have managed to survive. I wish I could tell you about the journey, but all I know is that I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. This is my home now. Thank you. Um, Like I tell you, sometimes I go to these places and people want to argue with me about immigration. I'm like, bro, I, I, I'm not getting paid for that. Uh, so that's the other thing that I, especially with these topics, you know, one of the biggest things for me that I stopped doing is definitely trying to justify why I continue to be here because it gets exhausting. People ask you, like, why don't you, if you don't like it here, why don't you leave? I'm like, actually, I do like it here. I just don't like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'll finish with this one. This is, anybody here love love? Love is cute, no? Are you guys in love? Oh, that, that's, on, that's, on, that's on love aguitado, honestly. <laughs> and it's not too, if you're in love, you really shout like, yes, I am. But uh, if that was your girlfriend, I would be like, oh, we got to talk. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> this next part, this is, uh, I'll leave you with this. Um, but I, honestly, el mensaje que les quiero dejar simplemente right now, right? I, at one point, you know, I was 16. I'm undocumented. I'm living in poverty. I'm also, oh, I, well, I don't know if you could tell, but I'm also de uh, uh, developing and understanding that I'm queer. So I'm like, I was developing these like three identities, right? And so, a los 16, I'm looking at my ceiling like, come on, God, throw me a bone here. ¿Qué más? <laughs> I was like, you know, Marimar con su perro pulgoso. <laughs> but then what I realized at 16 is when I started telling these stories and I started writing about the things that I was so embarrassed about or ashamed of, things that I had no control about, it's when I started to discover my voice and I started to discover that those are the actual things that connect me to the rest of the world. Most of us know what it feels like to be sad, to feel lonely, to feel depressed, but I think through being able to articulate your story and being able to respect other people's stories, I think that's the hardest part too. Oftentimes, so many people are scared of public speaking. This is the, if I give you the microphone right here, right now, and I call you up, most people are gonna be like, uh, you know? But I think for me, if you're comfortable in your voice and your own story, I think that's the end goal for you to stand wherever you are, prideful. And it's not an orgullo que subaje otra persona, but an orgullo that for you to be proud of the people that you represent. And hopefully, my goal in, in doing this is that wherever you go, wherever you stand, that you don't make yourself small to make somebody else feel big, or you know, that you stand in your power. Um, and that's how you are able to not let injustices happen to your family or injustice happen to the people you love. Um, so, con eso, I leave you with this. It's called My Revolutionary, and it goes like this. You tell me you don't like the city, that these buildings, this concrete numbs the senses, cages the spirit, and baby, your spirit was meant to be free. You, my love, were born to be revolutionary, free like the tobacco you offer to blow blessings free, like palabras sagradas que salen de tu boca y las rimas femeninas y masculinas that you bust here on stage. You are my revolutionary, not a guerrero, but a healer, because in times of conflict, mi rey, you heal. And more than body, I must agree with you that you are spirit, because more than your flesh, I'm a love con el corazón que tienes. You are the reason why I love men with noble hearts, the reason why I don't mind sharing a bed with someone. For men like you, I would write a million barks, get lost in Oakland and find your house beneath the brightest star. Mi vida, you come from tierra, where the spirits of those who fail to cross over Rome, you come from el desierto, but baby, we all know you are not deserted. You got me, and together we are four spirits like the four directions you have the creator behind you. You're his creation, his masterpiece, and in the journey you are traveling, you have managed to leave your footprints in my heart. I carry your breath in my hair, your teachings in my two spirit. You are fluid, como los rios que nuestra gente ha cruzado. You remind me that the only possessions we have in this world are our bodies and our voice, and the combination of the two must be used to honor the spirits of antepasados. This life is a ritual, and in its sacredness, I'm so glad I'm able to hug you. You are my revolutionary, and as you make your transition back home into the arms of your mother, into the arms of lips of your father, I ask that you take this poem with you. I ask that you take a memory and me with you. Plant these in la tierra que te vio nacer, en esta tierra que ha sido bautizada con la sangre sagrada de nuestra gente, and I will assure you that wherever you be, this love will sprout in you. Como el sol por las mañanas, this poem will shine on you. Now go to wherever home is. Donde en San Jose, you leave a brown boy that has nothing but love and respect for you. In the meantime, I will stay here in this city, in this cage, singing and singing till the system crumbles, to borders break, till the earth shakes and our people become awake. I will be here singing and singing until the day we're all free to return home. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, Y'all so cute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you like a collective air hug. Así. Um, es un placer estar con ustedes. I hope to get to know some of you. I hope that you get a lot out of the conference. Again, build networks. Don't be scared to be shy. Raise your hand. Sit in the front. Ya veo unos que luego llegan y se sientan atrás. Um, pero es un placer estar con ustedes. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Yosimar. Un placer. Que pasen a beautiful morning.